接下来，让我们有请 GSV 全球硅谷创始人兼首席执行官 Michael Mo 先生为我们带来“未来之未来”的主题演讲。有请。Our next keynote speaker is Mr. Michael Mo, founder and CEO of GSV. His speech topic is "The Future of the Future." 你好。I'm very thankful for uh, to be here and with and for our co-host, of course, Tal, New Oriental, Beijing Normal University, uh, Tencent, CDRF. Um, this last three days has been terrific, and I feel very privileged to be in Beijing with such great people, focused on such important ideas. I'm going to talk about the future of the future. The firm I'm at is an investment firm, and with the, and doing、um, several other things that are related. You might say, "Why am I at this education innovation conference?" It's because at GSV, our passion is really about、um, that we believe that talent is basically equally distributed around the world, but opportunity is not. And so, our vision is to ensure that everybody. Has an equal opportunity to participate in the future, and the mission is to accomplish that by accelerating innovation, education, and talent to optimize impact. So, when you look at kind of where we've come from, the circle of life 500 years ago looked like this: you lived and died approximately within five miles of where you were born. Your parents' past equaled your future. So, if your dad was a farmer, you were a farmer. If your dad was a prince, you were a prince. And then we had this tsunami of technology explosion that basically made the world more connected. It expanded horizons. The first technology that that did this, the Gutenberg press in 1439, and then we had the steamboat, which came in 1756. We had the locomotive engine. This was 1804. The telephone in 1876, the automobile in 1885, and the airplane in 1903, all connecting people to the world. Then, 50 years ago, Gordon Moore postulated that computing power was going to double every couple of years. This became known as Moore's law. And what's remarkable about Moore's law? Is not only that it actually happened, which has basically not only transformed the technology industry but translate transformed society, but this phenomena of connecting people became even more pronounced. But things sped up in a material way. Things got faster and faster. So when you look at technology after it became commercialized in terms of how long it took to reach 50 million people, the air airplanes it took 50, it took 68 years from the time airplanes were introduced. To have 50 million passengers, the telephone took 50 years to reach 50 million people. Electricity took 46 years.、And、then Moore's law came. The computer took 14 years. Cell phone took 12 years. The internet took seven years. You had Facebook took three years. Twitter took two years to reach 50 million people.、And、then Pokemon Go reached 50 million people in 19 days. And so what we've seen、um, is this incredible upgrade. Of technology cycles, making things better, faster, cheaper. You know, just you know, here's the telephone, just the mobile phone, just as an example. I'm thinking how much dramatically better the mobile phones have become, have gotten in the last even 10 years. And so, when you look at technology and computers, it's been on this exponential curve, where the capabilities just keep on getting better and better. Humans' capabilities are on a linear curve, and we're here. And what does this mean? This means that pretty soon technology will replace the technologist, but even more fundamental. While technology keeps on getting better, people aren't happy. In fact, people are, are less happy today than they've been、um, in many years. They're getting progressively less happy, even with this amazing technology that's been introduced. You look in the United States; suicide rates are up 30%. U.S. deaths from opioids went up 45 percent in 2017 alone. This was a headline from the Wall Street Journal、uh, just a couple weeks back. U.S. life expectancy falls further, and, and, and that's coming from some of these different issues that are at work. 
And we talk about these amazing cell phones and you know, the mobile devices. People are on them all the time. So in 2008, an average person was on their mobile device 20 minutes. Today, it's three, three hours. And so, and studies have shown that that's not necessarily healthy for you. In fact, it's been linked to depression and anxiety. There was a third grade class in Boston, Massachusetts. And this class was asked to design the perfect playground. And that perfect playground, at the front of that playground, had a sign that said, no cell phone use. Because even these third graders realized that something was wrong with just how dependent people have become to their mobile devices. Look at the number one class at Yale University and at Harvard University. They're both happiness classes. So you think about this, the best and the brightest students, the ones that have achieved everything to get into these prestigious Ivy League schools are taking happiness classes because they feel like something's missing, right? So the world overall has been getting healthier, wealthier, and wiser, but it's not been equally distributed. And so when you look at the fact that there's three billion people on the planet that live on $2.50 a day or less, you have 22,000 people who die every single day from starvation. You have 2,000 people that die every day from lack of clean water. And you have about a quarter of the world's population that doesn't have access to electricity. So it's pretty hard to, to, to participate in the future. And, and uh, Arne Duncan made the point when you're focused on where you're going to have to eat. And so that's just a fundamental issue that, that faces society. When you look at SAT scores, which are the golden ticket to get in the most prestigious universities, there's a direct correlation between your household income and SAT scores. So what the SAT does the best job of predicting is how wealthy your family is. When you look at the most prestigious universities, 75% of the students from the, the most elite schools come from the top 25% household incomes. If you come from a bottom quartile household family, you have just an 8% chance of graduating from any college. So you add this all up, and if you are born poor, you have a 70% chance of remaining poor. So in other words, basically we've come full cir circle. Your future is determined how well you select your parents. And you know that's just fundamentally not fair. And people recognize uh, an unfair advantage when they see an unfair advantage. So what are the solutions to this? One is how do we invest in education? So we know that there's a return, return on education um, is significant, but where do you spend it? So James Heckman's a Nobel laureate economist. He said by age five, it is, it, it's possible to predict with depressing accuracy how, who will complete high school and who won't. So 52% of all low-income kindergarten students aren't ready when they come into kindergarten. What does that, ha what does that mean? They have a 25% more chance uh, likely to drop out of high school. If you drop out of high school, you are eight times more likely to go to prison. And if you look at the prison population in the United States, 80% of prisoners were high school dropouts. We know the, the empirical studies show that the earlier you invest in education, the greater return that you receive. In fact, a dollar invested in pre-K uh, returns $7 in return. 85% of the human brain development be, uh, is before age five, yet 98% of education spending is after age five. And so the Chinese get this, in fact, spend almost three times more than US families on early education. So that's one area. Second area is college education. So there's a direct correlation between level of college attainment and GDP per capita. And GDP per capita, of course, is a proxy for quality of life, you know, standard of living. And so um, we also know that one year added to a country's college attainment produces 17% increase in GDP. The good news is uh, more and more people are going to college, so in 1900, in the world, there were just 500,000 students. Today, there's 207 million students around the world in colleges. And by 2030, that's going to double to 414 million. 
Singapore is probably the best example of investing in human capital and education and innovation and what it was able to do to transform a country. So in 1965, when, it, when Singapore be, was in, became, got its independence, it was this tiny island with almost no resources, natural resources. Jamaica, uh, another tiny island, had about the same GDP per capita as Singapore. The United States had eight times greater GDP per capita in 1965. And so under Lee uh, Kuan Yew's leadership, he invested in education, infrastructure, innovation. And Singapore became the envy of the world. And in education, it became number one in the world in reading, science, and math. And what that translated into, from an economic standpoint, is a GDP per capita it basically uh, became equal to the United States. Jamaica, during that same time period, actually fell further behind being one-tenth uh, of the GDP per capita of the United States and Singapore by this time. The second major area is the digital transformation that's going on, how to use digital transformation to uh, benefit our goal of ensuring everybody has equal opportunity to particip participate in the future and have access to great education. So when Netscape went public in 1994, that unleashed the commercial application for the internet. This is Mark Andreessen in younger days. So the digital tracks have been laid over the last 25 years, now have 3.8 billion people on the internet. When you look at mobile phones, 4.8 billion people now have a mobile phone device. And just to put this in context, just 4.2 billion people have toothbrushes. Everything is smart, from your smartphone to your smartwatch, smart speakers, smart cities, even smart water. And from a telecommunication standpoint, things are getting cheaper and more ubiquitous. So in 1990, it cost $15 to make a 10-minute long-distance phone call. Today, with WhatsApp and Skype, it's free. And so this digital disruption that's taken place has impacted everything. So when you look at the five largest market cap companies in the world 50 years ago, it was IBM, AT&T, General Motors, Standard Oil, and Kodak. Over the next 50 years, two of these five companies actually went bankrupt. If you look at the five largest market cap companies in the world today, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, Facebook, they're all digital companies. They're all technology businesses. Seventh and eighth largest, Alibaba and Tencent. Uh, so you look at this. All this has happened in a remarkably short period of time. In fact, the oldest company on that list, Microsoft, wasn't around 50 years ago. And, these, you know, and three of these eight companies didn't exist 20 years ago. Take a close look at this picture. This is St. Peter's Square at the Vatican in 2005. Okay. Here's what it looks like today. So you've had this explosion in digital photography during that period of time. And what's, what's amazing is that Kodak, which is synonymous with photography, in fact, had the patent for digital photography in 2011 went bankrupt. That same year, 2011, Facebook bought Instagram for a billion dollars. So, you know, this, this digital disruption is both positive and negative, and how you participate in it is, is fundamental. Larry Page, the founder of Google and the CEO of Google, said lots of companies don't succeed over time. What do they fundamentally do wrong? They usually miss the future. And so how do you participate in the future? When you think about the future of the future, it's about imagining the possibilities. It's about solving problems in a world that exists today and where it's going tomorrow. So we think imagination to achieve our goal of ensuring that everybody has equal opportunity to participate in the future, driven by innovation education, is first and foremost about imagination. So thinking about how you, the reimagination that allowed the largest media company in the world to be uh, Facebook that doesn't have any of its own, you know, doesn't produce any of its own media, the largest lodging company in the world, Airbnb, doesn't have any of its own rooms. Spotify, largest music company in the world, doesn't produce any of its own music. Dropbox, the largest storage company, doesn't have any physical uh, warehouses. Uber, the largest transportation company in the world, doesn't have any of its own cars. So 
It just was able to imagine how to take advantage of solving a problem with the technology that existed. We also think it's important to, to challenge conventional wisdom and conventional sayings. So for example, do you remember this? Don't go into a stranger's car. Well, how's that worked? You got the three companies, Didi, Lyft, and Uber, that are worth $150 billion by having strangers go in their car. Another saying, don't meet people online. Well, in the United States today, one in five new marriages begin online. How about nice guys finish last? Well, Tom Zhang from Tal has shown that nice guys finish first with the largest market cap education company in the world. Howard Schultz is a very nice guy at Starbucks, and they finish first. So Albert Einstein, Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge, and I think in the case of how we solve this problem, you know, imagination really is the core driver of what we need to do. So that same creativity and that same reimagination that happened to replace this ridiculous idea that you stood out in the middle of the street, put out your hand to get a car to pick you up, um, needs to be applied to education. So this idea of a teacher standing in front of a classroom asking a question, everybody raise their hand, and who knows, who knows the answer? Again, we need to reimagine how to accomplish um, more effective ways to teach students. Here's another saying, education doesn't scale. So historically, education was thought to be this kind of incremental, cottage, non-scalable business. What we're seeing with technology, and specifically what's going on with the internet, you're seeing these rapidly scaled companies that are using smartphones and the, the app economy to reach in tens of millions of students fastest, what I call weapons of mass instruction. Because these weapons of mass instruction are scaling at unprecedented rates, re reaching students at breathtaking speeds. So Coursera has 36 million students on its platform. Udacity has 8 million students. Shutong, 10 million students. Coursera has 10 million users. Class Dojo's in 180 countries. The company's five years old. Clever's in 60,000 schools. Remind has 27 million monthly active users. Again, very young company. Udemy, 65,000 courses. Tel Education, 18 million students. New Oriental, 38 million students since 1993. VIP Kid and Cindy Me with 60,000 teachers. Company's five years old. Uh, Lu, Lu Li Shu, uh, 84 million users. Remarkable. Another you know, conventional wisdom saying, it's tough to invest in education. And part of that was pe people asked the question, not only can you make money, but should you make money? Well, last year, venture capitalists invested $4 billion in, in education technology companies, up from $700 million in 2010. You had 15 Chinese education companies go public last year alone. And there's now eight education technology unicorns. So that myth is basically being shattered. Here's another one. AI is going to eliminate all jobs. And in fact, McKinsey's estimated that 50% of all jobs that exist today are at risk of being replaced in 20 years. Andrew Ng, who's the co-founder of Coursera and the, one of the leading uh, AI people in the world, said AI is the new electricity. And it's the new electricity because it's highly disruptive, it's invisible, and it's going to be ubiquitous. Venture capitalists have invested significant amounts of money in artificial intelligence, about $14.4 billion last year alone. And it's estimated that $15.7 trillion will be added to the global economy by AI by 2030. So significant impact that AI is going to be in the marketplace. And it's freaking people out. So last year was um, a shocking moment for most of the world when uh, this gentleman, Nikiji, the top Go player in the world, got destroyed by AlphaGo. People couldn't believe how it happened and how, he just, uh, how it uh, happened so, so quickly. And so people are just amazed by what's going on with machines everywhere. They're fascinated by it, looking at you know, machines, robots doing backflips. So they're seeing things like, going, oh my god, what's going on here? And our job's going to be replaced, our humans are going to be replaced. It's, 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 it's scary for a lot of people. But humans, nobody gets too freaked out about a human doing a backflip. And you look at things like, I mean, cats do pretty amazing things too. 
and nobody's worried about cats replacing jobs, right? And so what I like to say is a horse that can count to 10 is an amazing horse, but it's not an amazing mathematician. And I think that's the way we got to think about how man and machine evolve to create a more productive, more equal society. Autonomous vehicles is another place where people are spending a lot of time, gets a lot of attention. Again, both exciting and, and, and scary at the same time. But it's pretty fundamental when you look at the problem with driving. So last year, 1.3 million people died from car accidents. It's estimated that autonomous vehicles is going to reduce 90% of automobile deaths. So it becomes a pretty easy decision, really, to see that technology accelerate, pretty fundamentally important for society. Think about how autonomous teaching, autonomous learning can help, not to replace teachers, but to make sure that the students get the knowledge that they need, the, the, get the, the education they need, so they don't get left behind. When you look at these statistics, if you have a bad teacher, or if you have a couple bad teachers in a row, you, you get so far behind that you'll never catch up. So AI can play a tr prominent role in creating solutions to this issue. Another conventional wisdom, you can stop learning after you graduate from college. And in the old world, that was kind of true. I mean, the old world, you played from 0 to 5, you learned from 5 to 25, you had a job from 25 to 65, and you retired at 65 plus. In the world that we're in today, you're going to learn from the time you're born to the time you retire, if you ever retire. So you're no longer going to fill up your knowledge tank to age 25 and drive off through life. You're going to continually need to replenish what you know on an ongoing basis. We call this Kaizen EDU, standing for continuous learning. In the old world, you had one job with one company for your entire career. In the new world, you're going to have 15 different jobs from the time you graduate from college uh, till when you retire. And millennials like this gig economy. They like flexible, being flexible. So 82% of millennials want to have be, be flexible workers. In China, already 60% of workers are flexible. In the United States, already 40% are flexible. And so as we reimagine re education and how do we address these issues, how do we solve these problems, how do we make the world not only a better place, but a happier place, and how do we use technology to aid us in this? We think about some of the big creative ideas, is thinking about how adaptive technology that you see with a Netflix or a Spotify or an Amazon getting more personalized, more individualized, because it's combined with diagnostic technology you see with an IBM Watson or 23andMe. And together, that becomes this personalized learning, this just for me learning, having your own personal robot that's helping you learn what you need to know and filling in your proficiency, where, where, where you have deficits and accelerating where you have proficiencies. Blockchain is another area that we think has got tremendous opportunity to uh, be not only disruptive, but really advance learning and democratizing um, opportunity for people. As blockchain is undoubtedly the next generation of computing platforms, and we see a specific application, the old, old knowledge currency was the degree, and the more prestigious the degree, the more, you know, the more valuable that was in the marketplace. We don't think the degree is going away, but we do think degrees are going to be augmented by what we call knowledge as a currency theme, which is you're able to represent what you know, your knowledge, what skills you have, your aptitude in a variety of ways, and that becomes the currency as opposed to the old diploma. You create your old, this knowledge portfolio that basically uh, allows you to show you know, what you know, what you've done, what you've accomplished, and so forth. We think that the media model also is going to be important how you reimagine education, because there's a lot of things that we can learn from media business in terms of how we can engage students, how we tell stories, models that create increase access, lower costs, and so forth. A theme within this media model is I call it Hollywood meets Harvard. And so this is thinking about how Hollywood has done such an amazing job of creating the engagement, because you can't learn if you're not engaged. I would argue that the musical Hamilton has taught more people American history than textbooks or classes did. Today, you can learn tennis from Serena Williams uh, uh, through a master class program, and that's remarkable. The gamification of everything, we think this is a huge opportunity in terms of how we help people learn on an ongoing basis. There's now 2.6 billion gamers in the world today up from 100 million in 1995. 
people like Elon Musk said, I like video games. In fact, that's what got me into software engineering when I was a kid. Mark Zuckerberg said, I definitely wouldn't have gotten into programming if I hadn't played games. So we think if you can learn by doing things that you want to do as opposed to push, makes an awful lot of sense. Kids already spend 10,000 hours playing video games from the time they're in kindergarten to the time they graduate from high school. That's about the same amount of time they spend in the classroom. So if we can make video games not only fun but educational, that's a big deal. And so this concept of invisible learning I think is, is huge as it relates to how do we solve these issues of the need to learn on an ongoing basis, keeping students engaged, and making it in a way that you don't even think that you're learning. Games is an example of that. You know, looking at educational uh, programs that, that again are, are more of like a, like a, a show um, are things that we think can be part of this kind of future of learning and how we accomplish our goals. And just as I close, I want to talk about kind of the, uh, marrying this, what you know, and, and how you're productive in society with, through your career and with jobs. This is a headline just a couple of weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal. It talks about job openings outnumbered unemployed Americans for the first time in history. So in other words, there's more jobs out there than there are people looking for work. But the problem is, is as much as there's the jobs that are out there, people don't have the skills and education to fill those jobs. So you basically have the square peg in a round hole. So what do you do to change that? You've got to think about what a modern learner needs to know. And so what we don't know for sure, by any stretch of imagination, what the future really looks like when we look out five years, 10 years, 20 years, but we do think about a curriculum that will give students the skills they need to participate in the future, and we call it the seven C's. So we think these seven C's are foundational in what you need to know to be able to adapt and to learn and to keep on participating as, as things evolve. The first C being critical thinking, problem solving. The second C being creativity. Creativity is solving problems. Entrepreneurship's about solving problems and creativity. Communication, that's not just speaking, that's also using other media and other mediums to communicate, whether it's text or presentations. Cultural fluency. The world is getting to be a smaller place, a more interconnected place, and having an understanding of other cultures and how different norms and other, other people work is, we think, important. Civic engagement. What does it mean to be a citizen? Collaboration. How do you participate on teams? Character. You know, what, what, what makes the, the, your integrity and, and the other aspects of, of building trust and being the type of person that people want to work with? And, and higher. Those are all things that we think are fundamental. So as I close, um, I live in San Francisco, I live in Silicon Valley, and we think um, there's a, a gigantic opportunity to connect Silicon Valley um, to the new Silk Road. Silicon Valley has obviously been the home of innovation and disruptive technology for a number of years, and what we see happening is China has become the most important education market in the world. And we think combining those two forces can start to create the solutions, the types of solutions that can really make the difference for achieving our goal of ensuring that everybody has an equal opportunity to participate in the future. And so um, I feel very privileged to be here today. Um, obviously, um, it's, it's just the start. But as the Chinese proverb says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So we're here planting trees today. Again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here, um, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mr. Michael Moe for a great speech.